Hi there, welcome back to A Kind of Demata. I grabbed another coffee and now I'm ready to uh, to dig on into the morphology and the anatomy of um, of the members of this phylum. And I'm going to go through them um, one by one. I'm going to be starting with the crinoids. And I will be doing this because um, not only are these animals quite... Um, um, different in their form in some respects, but also because I'm afraid there's a whole terminology that's been built up around this group as a whole because they're relatively unusual as animals. So, for example, the anus and the mouth have special names within um, within the sea urchins, for example. So I will be mentioning these special term terms. Um, however, I think that if you're in a position to ever want to communicate about these creatures, my two cents, I admit as a non-echinoderm worker, is that it's fine to use the words mouth and anus. But you know, there you go. So without further ado, let's talk about the crinoids. So the crinoids are otherwise known as sea lilies. These are usually sessile echinoderms. They have pentaradial or pentameral symmetry. They are rooted by a stalk for at least part of their life cycle to normally the seabed, sometimes some other structures as we'll get onto in a second. Some forms have developed past a fixed stage to become free living. And this is particularly true of some modern forms, which uh, will often have a, um, a fixed stage in their life cycle uh, where they're attached and then uh, become a free living adult. Modern forms generally live in dense clusters or forests, and these range from warm waters around the tropics all the way through to the icy conditions we find in polar latitudes at a variety of different depths. So we're talking about quite a broad range of environmental tolerances within this group as a whole. Fossil forms we typically consider to have formed part of the shallow water and sessile, so that's attached um, benthic community. We know over 6,000 fossil species that range from the early Ordovician through to the present day. So that's quite a long time range as well. And there are some truly remarkable specimens of crinoids in the, um, in the fossil record. And in particular, I wanted to highlight that um, we have uh, quite a few records of crinoid colonies in the fossil record. One very famous example that's housed in the German Museum is shown on this slide here in a photo taken by a uh, one of our MPhil students, Jenna Davenport. This is a Jurassic example of a, of a monospecific crinoid colony. So that means a crinoid colony that we know was made of um, individuals of just one species. And these are um, found actually um, throughout uh, rocks that were laid down during a specific time period in the Jurassic that's called the Tuartian oceanic anoxic event. So this is a brief period where there was geographically widespread dysoxia within the ocean, so low oxygen levels. And we keep on finding from this time period quinine colonies preserved on wooden rafts. Up to 100 individuals will make up one of these colonies and they are found covering bivalve encrusted logs that can be up to 14 meters in length. So we're talking really really chunky structures here. And recent research has suggested that these um, floating log rafts could have persisted for at least 10 years. And the idea at the moment is that these animals thus attached to the log whilst it was floating and actually lived as a community attached to a floating log until at some point uh, after um, a decade, maybe two decades, it sunk to the seafloor to be preserved as we see here. So these are really interesting uh, and uh, I think really stunning fossil examples of crinoid colonies. So crinoids themselves comprise a segmented stalk or a stem. So once more, there are gonna be multiple words for multiple different bits of these creatures, sorry about that. And this is composed of things called columnals or ossicles. So you'll often hear people referring to crinoid ossicles as components of limestones. So ossicles. Those are fixed to the seabed. The stalk is fixed to the seabed by a root-like structure um, called the holdfast, as you can see labeled on this diagram. So stem uh, comprising ossicles, holdfast at the bottom. Attached to the top of the stem or the stalk 
is the main functional part of the animal. And the bit holding this is called variously the calyx, the aborval cup, or the theca. Sorry about this, that's three words that mean exactly the same thing. So theca we've come across before already, as with calyx, and it's just a descriptive term taken from Latin or Greek, um, describing kind of the, the, this kind of cup-shaped morphology where the, the business happens. The calyx itself is made of two rings of calcitic plates. These are called the basals, you can see here. Then overlying these, you have the radials. And that's true of many forms of crinoid. Some forms have added a second circle of smaller plates called the infrabasals. You can see these around here. Um, to interface between the basals and then the stem. These are called the dicyclic forms. So you've either got two or three rows of these plates. Then we have an upper oral surface of the calyx, which is covered by a flexible membrane that houses the mouth, um, which is usually centr centrally located between five radially arranged feeding grooves. So these radially, ra radially arranged feeding grooves meet in the middle um, where the mouth is found. We find the anus situated posteriorly on this animal, often modified by an anal tube, enhancing the efficiency of waste disposal. You can see that here. So from the calyx, we have the arms arising. Sometimes you'll hear these referred to as the brachials, and these extend upward from the calyx and together form the crown of the, the uh, crinoid. Most fossil crinoids, and about 25 recent genera, um, are stalked forms, such as the one that you can see here, attached to the seabed, and here. In modern oceans, however, uh, we find that the crinoid community is dominated by um, a group that has a mobile uh, adult form. Th these, you can see an example of this here, and these kind of move like uh, pneumatic umbrellas once they become adults after their attached juvenile form. So that's a quick lowdown on crinoid morphology. You may want to bear in mind that the stems of Paleozoic crinoids were probably quite different from those um, which we found, find in the group that survived the end Permian mass extinction. So we often find bits of stem um, in rocks. These are often circular or star-shaped in cross-section. Well, um, I'll be introducing those further into the next, um, in the next video. And as I've already mentioned, these are called ossicles, these bits that make up the stem of a crinoid. The fossil record of the crinoids is marked by a major expansion in the early Ordovician, especially in tropical regions. So this early expansion was marked by a period of intense morphological experimentation. There are lots of interesting forms around and we see lots of adaptive radiations happening. So these are, these are um, when a group of organisms kind of adapts very quickly to a particular, what we call an ecological niche, a way of living their lives. Virtually all Paleozoic crinoids were stalked and were traditionally grouped into three subclasses. I am not covering those here because I've only got a limited amount of time, um, but you can find more details in the suggested reading for this book, um, which is for this book, uh, the suggested reading for this lecture, which is by Benton and Harper. Crinoid diversity hit a peak during the early Carboniferous. Um, so crinoids during this time period were abundant. There were lots of them and they were diverse. There were lots of species, so lots of individuals, lots of species. And then they became less so as the Carboniferous ended, especially when we hit the late Carboniferous, Carboniferous glaciation. I've shown, put on this slide, a couple of interesting and um, really well-preserved Carboniferous forms for you. The first is a really nice example from um, America. And it's found amongst a community made up of many species, all of which have different stalk lengths, suggesting that you have this kind of fossil um, uh, crinoid uh, community um, where you have suspension feeders that were feeding from different levels above the sediment surface, which is really very neat. And as you can see, the preservation is absolutely beautiful. Also looks a tiny bit like a, uh, a xenomorph from the alien movies, uh, face hugger. So the face hugger part of the alien life cycle. But that's neither here nor there. Um, on the right, you can see an example of uh, the group of crinoids 
the articulator that really exploded um, post the, um, the Permo-Triassic extinction. Uh, so all post-Paleozoic um, crinoids, uh, with a few exceptions only in the Triassic, are members of this group called the Articulata. And the example on the right is a specimen um, from a famous um, Lagerstatter uh, in Germany called the Holzmarden. So this is a really nicely preserved example of a member of this group, the Articulata. So this is a Mesozoic example of a fossil crinoid. So that's the crinoid. And I wanted to quickly highlight the morphology and the anatomy of some of the extinct groups, just in case you ever come across them. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this because they're not particularly common unless you're in particular areas um, in, in terms of both um, space and time. So sometimes these are common, but in very particular um, rocks. So many of these are grouped together under this banner, the Blastozoans. These are creatures that had a short stem but, and often lacked um, arms. They're probably high level filter feeders and they're often characterized by pores which are called brachials that punctuate the plates in the thecae. These thecal plates are punctuated by holes called brachials. Some groups of these, such as the ones on the uh, left of this slide here, are called the cystoids, and these become very widespread in the mid-Paleozoic for a time period. Uh, that also includes the, uh, this group, the blastozoic, and also includes the blastoid, which you can see um, up here, um, a lovely picture by Ernst Haeckel, um, which were around from the Silurian to the Permian. These are lovely little extinct creatures, which are pentamer pentamerally symmetrical. They had short arms and a cup or a theca that was quite globular, so kind of globe-like in form, and composed. it was composed of a ring of three basal plates. So they're lovely creatures if you ever come across one. There are also the eocrinoids. So these are um, examples of the earliest brachial bearing echinoderms. So the first creatures to have this hole punctuating the thecal plate. And you can see on the far right here, a member of a really weird form called the paracrinoids. This is an odd group of arm bearing echinoderms. These have globular thecae and numerous irregularly arranged plates. So that's a sampling really of the diversity of the Paleozoic um, fossil record. Um, I didn't, don't expect you to remember any of the names and I don't particularly expect you to remember um, any of their defining features, but I just wanted to give you this kind of idea of the, the kind of diversity that was in the fossil record that we have no longer. And I wanted to quickly finish the extinct groups with a shout out to a lovely group called the Carpoids that really epitomize the nature of the fossil record of this group, because these are amongst the weirdest of all animals in my humble and non-expert terms of the um, echinoderms opinion. So these are marine animals that ranged in age from the mid Cambrian through to possibly the late Carboniferous. They have a calcitic echinoderm um, type skeleton and they lacked radial symmetry. Uh, in fact, they lacked any form of symmetry in many cases at all. They are completely asymmetrical creatures. You can see a, a typical example of one of these here with this long tail, um, this weird arm sticking out the other end, um, a thing called a gonopore, uh, the anus that's just cheekily located on one surface here for no apparent reason and possible gill slits. So that's kind of weird. So they lack symmetry entirely. And researchers, including my mate Imran, who I mentioned earlier, have spent a really long time trying to understand where they fit on the tree of life. Some workers indeed have uh, suggested they could be chordates, they could be more closely related to things with backbones than they are to echinoderms. Today, we're pretty sure that they are indeed echinoderms. Uh, they were amongst the earliest branching uh, groups that we met in video one, we think nowadays. So if you look at old um, bits of the literature, you may actually find these referred to as possible chordates. We don't think that's the case anymore, but they are truly weird creatures. So that is the carpoids. We're going to move on now. We're going to have a look at the echinoids. So remember, we've got the echinodermata. That's our phylum that includes also uh, crinoids and starfish and sea cu cucumbers. And then within this, one of the groups is, this, uh, is the echinoidea. So the echinoidea, um, which we'll be learning about now, are the well-known sea urchins and sand dollars. 
These are animals that have a robust, rigid endoskeleton um, that's also called a test, right? So this test is composed of plates of calcite coated by an outer skin, hence it being an endo rather than an exoskeleton, and covered generally with spines. They've got a long history from their first radiation, which occurred during the Ordovician period. Their tests can be either globular, so that means kind of globe-shaped. You can see an example on the left-hand side here of uh, a globular uh, sea urchin, and these are called the regular echinoids, or they can be discoidal to heart-shaped. So you can see an example on the right-hand side here. These are the irregular echinoids. So you've got regular and irregular. Classification within these groups is often based on the arrangement of plates around the anus and the mouth on the two sides of the creature and based on their mouth structures, FYI. <clears throat> In order to introduce their anatomy, I'm going to be using a regular echinoid. So they have a lower surface here that's called the adapical or the oral surface. And this has in its center, generally, the mouth. The upper surface is either called the apical or aboral surface, and this has the anal opening. Okay, so it's kind of a, a weird body plan right there, or at least a weird body plan from our um, frame of reference. The test itself is built of a network of hundreds of interlocking calcite plates organized into 10 segments. These radiate, radiate from the oral surface um, and converge on the aboral surface. So you can see examples of this in this diagram here. The narrower segments are called the ambulacral areas and these carry the animal's tube feet. So you can see the ambulacral area marked on this diagram here. And these alternate with a wider or interambulacral area, um, which is armed with spines. So you can see the interambulacral areas here on this diagram. So the aboral surface this is the upper surface, the one with the anus on it, has a ring of what we call a five gentle plates. These plates are perforated by a hole to allow the re release of gamete, gametes. So this is something to do with the reproduction of the organism. So you can see these marked on um, here. And in the middle of that, you can see a thing called the periproct. This is just a, another word for the anal opening in these groups. It's partially covered by a number of smaller plates attached to a membrane. On the underside, you've got a thing called the peristome. This is the opening for the mouth, which contains the mouth parts. So once more, I apologize for the terminology here. I'm very happy for you just to use the, the terms anus and mouth. Um, and the, this mouth has a sophisticated feeding apparatus comprising five individual jaws, each of which has one tooth. This is often called an Aristotle's lantern. So I suppose technically our, our fancy words periprox and um, peristome refer to the opening rather, rather than the actual structure itself. So bear that in mind if you're ever trying to um, talk to another echinoderm worker, for example. You can see their internal anatomy in a fairly simplified form on the left here, including this really cool water vascular system. So that was a crash course in the anatomy of the, e the, of the echinoids. There are two significant evolutionary events that I wanted to highlight in the history of these groups that are marked by sudden divergences from this regular echinoid morphology to generate irregular burrowing echinoids. Irregular echinoids are creatures that have this marked bilateral symmetry that is overprinting the pentameral symmetry. And that reflects the fact they're specialized for forward movement as part of this burrowing life cycle. The first of these events happened in the Jurassic and led subsequently to a range of irregular burrowing echinoids. And the second, which occurred during the Paleocene, led to the quasi-informal sand dollars. Both of these required large architectural changes to the body plan um, of the echinoids to adapt the animal to burrowing. For example, as you can probably imagine, if you're a burrower, large, large spines are just gonna make your life really difficult and they aren't really needed for protection. The earliest examples of this trend occur in the early Jurassic, in the Sinemurian, 
um, where we start seeing an asymmetrical test, an asymmetrical skeleton, we see short and numerous spines. Uh, we see large pores in these uh, in the adapical um, region of these creatures, and we see a posteriorly placed anus, plus other changes um, that start to develop. So you can see this example um, first appearing here on the diagram that I've uh, I've placed here that shows this change. And by the Toarchian, much of the toolkit of adaptations had evolved for a burrowing mode of life. So these things were completely informal. And this toolkit, the um, different mem parts or adaptations that we see within this group are shown on this diagram here that include the flattening and the elongation of the skeleton, um, a decrease in the size of tubercles and spines, um, and this posterior movement of the, um, the anus and anterior movement of the mouth. So by the early Cretaceous, we have um, really quite um, specialized irregular echinoderms appearing, which have one of the ambulacral areas modified to form a food groove to help with um, feeding, for example, and a series of tube feet that were extendable and had flattened ends to assist in respiration while these things are living in their burrows. And these things um, are, di are specialized, as you can see from this diagram, to differing modes of life, such as different depths um, beneath the sediment. We tend to see in the fossil record that mobile regular forms graze on both hard and soft substrates, whereas our burrowers have this irregular anatomy and have adapted to different depths. There's a really famous example of this and some really nice work has been um, placed into the study of a genus called Microsta, which has um, really um, highlighted the evolution of irregular echinoids and how this is coupled to their ecology, so their mode of life. So the Asteroidea and the Ophiuroidea is where we're finishing this particular video. So these are the starfish and the brittle stars. And I wanted to start this by highlighting that Asterozoan skeletons, Asterozoa is the group that includes those two, um, disintegrate very rapidly after death because they have feeble cohesion between their skeletal plates. Thus, um, recognizable fossils are, of whole individuals, for example, are relatively rare within this group. And we won't be spending much time talking about their anatomy as a result. When you do find these as fossils, it's usually in Lagerstadt and these sites of exceptional preservation. So with that caveat, bear, here is a very short introduction to the starfish. Bear in mind that they are, are common in shallow seas today and their biology has made them pretty successful. I particularly like these creatures because of their feeding mode. It's unusual but deadly. They are actually just sit on top of their food. They are in, evert their stomach, they turn their stomach inside out and absorb their victim into that everted stomach before then returning it to themselves. This group first appeared during the Ordovician. As the name implies, they are star-shaped in outline, as you can see here. They usually have five arms radiating outwards from the central body or discs. There are, there are a few that have significantly more than that. The mouth is found on the underside, the anus is on the top, and it, they actually have a good amount in common with what you've already seen in the echinoids in terms of the, the, the terminology and the specializations within this group. So that was a very, very quick overview of the starfish for you. And we're gonna finish in the last video by once more looking at the fossils of this group and by highlighting why they're useful to us as geologists. So I'll see you in a few minutes in that video.